Well, this afternoon, I'll talk about my value creation thinking uh, book, and I'll review some really big, important ideas. Uh, first is that the, the engine of economic uh, progress is business firms creating value for customers. Second is that there are four critical components to the purpose of the firm, and the third big idea is that management's top priority, most critical responsibility, in my opinion, is to develop and sustain a knowledge building culture for the firm. Now, I'm hopeful that these ideas will be useful to you in planning out your future uh, career path. And ideally, these ideas may be able to enable you to rise as high as your skills and determination and insight uh, can take you. The Value Creation Thinking book is one endorsement I got from Dominic Barden at, at McKinsey, and it hits the nail on the head as to what the book is trying to do. The book provides an important contribution to our understanding of capitalism at a critical moment and an illuminating roadmap for the future of business. Now, Dominic Barton uh, co-founded an organization called Focusing Capital on the Long Term. And the website you might want to visit is fclt.org. And it's a group of uh, important business leaders and investment managers that are concerned about fundamental questions about capitalism, about what kind of a society makes the most sense for everybody, and in particular, getting over this short-termism where management is incentivized to make very short-term decisions and not have a long-term perspective. And the final point that this group deals with is the fundamental purpose of the corporation. So let's uh, take a minute to talk about that. The purpose of the firm, I believe, can be broken down into four components. Management needs to provide a vision that inspires and motivates employees to commit their working lives to making the world a better place. Management also needs to orchestrate the firm to survive and prosper through continuous innovation and efficiency gains. Now, nothing works over the long term if a firm steadfastly fails to earn the cost of capital. <coughs> In financial terms, the cost of capital is the minimum average acceptable rate of efficiency. Okay, the third point is to uh, sustain win-win partnerships. Now, that's fairly obvious for the firm and its suppliers. But the concept is much broader than that. Think about Amazon and its a Kindle ebook reader. Now, that Kindle provides benefits to authors, to readers, to entrepreneurs, and it makes a ton of money for Amazon. Now, that profitability is earned because Amazon provides very high value to customers who use the Kindle. And the fourth component is taking care of future generations. Now, for sure that means environmental sustainability. Moreover, there's something deeper going on here. Management needs to ensure that at a very early stage, that when designing a new product or a manufacturing process, that they, at that early stage, figure out the best way to minimize waste and harm to the environment. Now, what have I not mentioned that typically is mentioned about the purpose of the firm? It's maximizing shareholder value. Now, my take is that maximizing shareholder value is best positioned not as a purpose of the firm, but as a result of a firm successfully achieving its purpose. What else have I failed to mention? Corporate social responsibilities. If you define the firm as I have with these four components, 
The firm's corporate social responsibilities are already embedded into the firm, and they're not an ethical add-on that's necessary. Now, I mentioned that the most important task for management is to develop and sustain a knowledge-building culture. Well, what do we mean by that? Fundamentally, it's about understanding why. Now, uh, business students learn about lean thinking and lean manufacturing. And the preeminent firm is Toyota. And Toyota has what they call the five whys. Uh, Frontline employees in the factory, when they encounter a problem, they'll ask why five times, drilling down to get the root cause so that they can fundamentally fix the problem. Now, related to lean thinking is systems thinking. And very, very briefly, systems thinking is you always approach something and, and get absolute clarity what is the goal of this system. The next point is you identify the key constraint which is impeding the performance of the system, and that's what you fix. Top priority on the key constraint. And the third key element of systems thinking is to watch out for an overly excessive focus on what's called localized efficiency. Let me give you an example. Imagine a production line. There's machine A, it feeds products into machine B. Machine A is fast, machine B is slow. So what happens at machine B? A lot of work and process builds up. Machine B is a key constraint in the system. But all those folks working on machine A, they get measured based on the performance of machine A. They convince management to install an even faster machine at A. And the accountants measure their performance as improving for machine A. What happens to the overall performance of the system? It gets much worse at the bottleneck. Even more stuff is building up at the bottleneck at B. So that's a key point on bottlenecks and localized efficiency. So here's a definition that I like for a knowledge building culture. Supports questioning of existing knowledge and encourages experiments that can systematically confirm or reject hypotheses of practical importance to improving efficiency, <coughs> innovation, and strategy. In other words, it's all about insights. Insights, you can have two kinds of insights. Scale insights are the big ones, big breakthroughs in thinking. If you're involved in a firm, it can fundamentally change your strategy, uh, how you operate the firm. Process insights is more the day-to-day -day stuff, where if you go to work and you can figure out a problem and incrementally improve a process, you've had a good day. So process improvements are also very important. Now let me give you an example <coughs> of a scale insight. In the 1960s, the dominant retailer in the US was Kmart, the number one retailer and highly profitable, uh, their business model was decentralized. In other words, a store, that single word store, what did it mean to Kmart management? That a store was, was the focus of the business and the way you manage the store is that the store manager gives them all the responsibilities for pricing, for ordering, that's how they became successful. Now, Sam Walton, who's, who founded Walmart with a few five and dime stores in Arkansas, very, very smart, savvy guy. And he came up with the notion that a store is not the conventional definition of a store, but a store is a, is a node in a system. In other words, it, a store is a part of an integrated system tied to distribution. It changes everything. So you make centralized decisions. And uh, the trucks on Walmart, they run full both ways. They don't do that at Kmart. Everything changed. Now Walmart is the world's number one retailer. And it all started with a strategic insight 
that scaled up. Now we've been talking about value creation. And let's introduce return on investment. By the way, value creation is, is just two words. We hear it so often. Now, what is a useful definition of value creation? Here's a definition that I find helpful. Value creation is about helping people to achieve progress in efficiently getting a job done that's important to them. It's a, it's a simple and I think a powerful way to think about value creation. It, it gets down to getting jobs done that you want to get done. So, if you're highly skillful in value creation, then if you're a business firm, on the far left, you invest $100, and a year later, you've generated $115. That's a 15% return on investment. Is it good or bad? Well, what's the average return? The average return is 6%. You invest $100, a year later, you get 100 of 106. Think of that as the average, the opportunity cost. Okay. Now, if you are below average in creating value on the far right, you're a value dissipator. You invest $100, you only get back 103. Now, these simple graphs here is the key to understanding the stock market. Because if you're a value creator, what the market is looking for is can you invest large sums of money at these wealth-creating high returns? The market wants you to reinvest and grow your business. If you're average, that's kind of a ho-hum thing. If you invest a dollar, the market will value it at a dollar. Now, if you're a value dissipator, what the market is not looking for is a very aggressive management that wants to grow this business without any concern <coughs> for the low level of return. Now, these key ideas, as I say, are central to understanding how the stock market works and how individual firms are valued. Let's talk about competition and resource allocation. Now, capitalism is all about allocating resources. And if you think about uh, the key elements of capitalism, it's freedom, property rights, voluntary transactions, and then a level competitive playing field. Now, by that I mean, if, you're, if you look at uh, Greece or Italy, that's not a free market system, that's cronyism. So there's a difference between crony capitalism and free market capitalism. With crony capitalism, what counts is who you know in government to get a favor. What counts when you have a free market system is how skilled are you in delivering value to customers. So that's why we want a level competitive playing field and resources can move away from firms that are dissipating value because they're just not skillful enough and the capital can flow to innovative new firms and established firms that are creating value and serving customers. So here's an example. You know, some years ago, Blockbuster had those clumpy, you know, VCRs where you could, you know, rent a movie. And my wife and I are, are in a you know, <coughs> watching TV and movies and TV series big time. So I'm a big customer of, of Blockbuster, and I hated the place. Very inefficient walk around. What I hated the most is I always, I get a lot of these, I always return them. And there's an outside chute where you can put them down. And they, then I get a letter saying that I didn't return my VCRs. And I go down and explain to the store manager, I did return the VCR. And then I get another letter saying they're going to, you know, have some uh, investigator come by and get their money back. It's a horrible experience. Now you have competition. Netflix started a peanut operation. Now, one thing about capitalism and allocating resources is adaptability and innovation. So Blockbuster 
a very rigid business model. They were highly profitable in the beginning. Okay, and they had all of these physical stores everywhere. Now, Netflix wasn't wedded to that physical structure. And they started out mailing out DVDs. And Blockbuster didn't worry about that because that didn't make much of a dent into their business in the beginning. Blockbuster could have acquired Netflix for, I think, two to three million dollars. Now it's worth <coughs> untold billions of dollars. Okay, now Netflix had those key ingredients. Very innovative, adaptable firm. Not only are they streamlining videos now, they're getting in uh, from creating original content, and I love it. I watch this stuff, you know, with my wife at night, whether it's The Walking Dead or Homeland or uh, it's great stuff. Okay, so resources have shifted. Now, if I go buy that Blockbuster store in my town, Blockbuster, you know, went bankrupt a long time ago. There's a thriving restaurant in that building. So you can see that if we were overly concerned that some people lost their job when Blockbuster closed down, you could say, maybe we shouldn't do that. Well, we, we need to do it. And people need to transition to a different job. And in the act of having this sort of a society, the Netflixes of the world and the Amazons of the world are created. <coughs> so let's bring this notion of return on investment and value creation into a life cycle framework so that we can understand how business firms go through a life cycle and how the stock market works. So if you look on the far left hand side, this is a classical case of how most firms transition. And it can take 40, 50, 60 years, quite often, for a firm to transition through a complete life cycle. On the far left side, the firm begins, and you see the economic return, the return on investment, can be below average. If they're skillful and they can commercialize an innovation, the blue line rises well above the average. The red line is the average cost of capital, 6% from the prior example. So a successful startup firm getting high returns and the best of both worlds, if they can reinvest large sums of money like Netflix is doing in that business, at the dash line, the reinvestment rate. So we can talk about financial performance in business firms in terms of two variables. The economic return on investment, the reinvestment rate, and we compare it to the cost of capital. If you're getting high returns and high reinvestment, that's a magnet for competition. Other firms try and duplicate what you're doing so they can reap those rewards. So eventually competition the economic returns fade towards the cost of capital. At this stage of the life cycle, it's especially important for a firm to build or acquire capabilities in order to secure competitive advantage, to forestall that fade towards average. Most firms eventually become mature, earning an average cost of capital return. They're bigger. Their reinvestment rate slows down. At that point, there's a tendency to focus in the extreme on your existing assets and not new investments. That's a troubling aspect and a key thing for management to watch out for. Now, when a firm becomes really rigid, complacent, business as usual, and the world changes and they don't change, their economic returns dip down below the cost of capital, and either they improve or they go bankrupt, like the blockbuster the example. Whoops. I'm not going to talk much about this because I could talk too long about this. It's in the book, it's a valuation model. You can connect this life cycle performance to a market price easily. If you think about a bond, what's a bond? You get interest and principal repayment, right? Those are net cash receipts, and they're pretty easy. Uh, they're known, by and large. And you assign a discount rate, and you get back the net cash receipts for present value, and you get a value for the bond. 
stock market is just like that with one big difference. The net cash receipts for a business firm are very hard to forecast. Okay, so what you do with the life cycle framework is you forecast economic return on investment and reinvestment rates. That generates a net cash receipt stream. Now when you forecast the future in life cycle terms, it's very useful because you can compare the firm's past track record and then gauge plausibility. And you can compare the past to the future and just see what, what it is you're doing. This is exactly what the Credit Suisse Hope Global Database that I'm going to be showing here soon, they provide this to 800 worldwide money managers. It's the dominant valuation model and global database. So the world's most sophisticated money managers are going to be working with charts that I'm going to show you in a minute. <coughs> Let's look at a company in life cycle terms. Uh, Eastman Kodak. This chart is in three panels. And the top panel is we got, this is all in inflation adjusted terms. I'm not going to get in all those technical details. They're in, in that book. The average long-term return on in investment, inflation adjusted, is 6% real. That's the red line. The, you take the firm's and their accounting statements, and you can adjust those and come up with what's called a cash flow return on investment. That's inflation adjusted. And we can see, back in the 1960s, the blue line, economic returns are above the cost of capital. Eastman Kodak was dominating the market for cameras and film. It was earning twice the cost of capital, and it was noted as a blue chip firm. Then over 50 years, you can see that the economic returns got the average, and eventually the low average, and then they went through a bankruptcy. The middle panel is the reinvestment rate, the growth rate. And those are the green bars. In later years, they were losing money and the reinvestment rate was negative. Now, we can capture what the stock market is doing with the bottom panel. It's called a relative wealth index. For a period of time, if your dividends and price appreciation matches the stock market, the S&P 500, you'll get a flat line. If you're outperforming the market, this trend line rises. If you're underperforming the market, the trend line goes down. So you can see for 35, 40 years, if the stock has been underperforming the market as the market kept on realizing the company's in worse shape than it thought it was. Now let me stop here. These three <coughs> panels, is this fairly clear as to what we're, we're plotting out for a company? Any questions on this? Okay. What's really going on here? Remember I said the most important thing is a knowledge building culture to a firm? Well, when you read through the history of Eastman Kodak, the world changed. Digital photography came on the scene. What's that going to do if your main business is films and cameras? Now, and by the way, you can't make this up. Digital photography was invented by an engineer at Eastman Kodak. And when, when you read his story, he said, I would walk down the halls of top management carrying <laughs> the first primitive version of digital photography, and I would show it to top management. You know what their reply was? That's interesting, but we're a film company. That's what I mean about a knowledge building culture being able to question the core assumptions and get feedback and be willing to, to question your, your strongest beliefs. And it, it was so strong at Eastman Kodak, they wouldn't even consider that the world had changed. So, so what we have in a, in a summary graphic here is that we have the purpose of the firm that we've talked about top priority to a knowledge building culture, you get that right, then in life cycle you know, terms, economic returns above the cost of capital, that, that's you know, top performance, with a reinvestment rate that will support a 
favorable fade rate, so they don't fade to average really rapidly. If you have a strong competitive advantage, you can stay at that preeminent level for a longer period of time by providing high value <coughs> to customers. Here's another company, Intuit. Now, Intuit, they, uh, they're famous for the Quicken software, Quicken books for the counting software. Okay, now this track record is much different than Eastman Kodak. <clears throat> in the top panel, you can see in the early 90s, they started out as a publicly traded company. High returns initially, then they hit a bump, the returns fell off, then they really got on a roll. Economic returns, three times the cost of capital, with high reinvestment rates, the best of both worlds, earn a high return, provide high value to a customer, and reinvest big in that business, and maintain that level of skill. So what do you see at the bottom, the relative <coughs> index for you know, uh, 20, 25 years, it's been steadily has outperformed the stock market. So what exactly is the key to this kind of performance? We don't have to get too deep in this analyzing. Let's just listen to what the CEO says. <coughs> Brad Smith, who's the CEO of Intuit, the culture you create lays a foundation that enables every other part of the company to grow and succeed. Job one in creating a culture is building a purpose-driven culture. What is the mission of the company? What is the bigger idea that we, all, we are all part of? It is the CEO's job to articulate and communicate this purpose across the company <clears throat> so team members at every level have something to rally around. At Intuit, our mission is to improve our customers' financial lives so profoundly they can't imagine going back to the old way. One way leaders can create an action-oriented environment is to match inspiration with rigor, adapted a rapid experimentation culture. Great ideas are simply hypotheses unless matched with tangible proof they deliver meaningful impact. A rapid experimentation culture cuts through hierarchy, especially if leaders hold their own ideas to the same scrutiny of testing, creating an environment where everyone can, everyone can innovate and debate turns into doing exactly what was missing from Eastman Kodak. So now you understand perhaps a, a, a bit <coughs> uh, more about what really creates the financial performance that we were looking at a few slides ago. So in terms of our diagram, you would give into a high marks on, on vision and a knowledge building uh, culture. Let's look at Medtronics. Uh, we're all familiar with a pacemaker. Medtronic invented the pacemaker advanced medical uh, technology. And they had a, a superlative CEO, Bill George, 1991 to 2001. And during, this is a large company, during that period of time, if you look at the top panel, there's this big surge in, in economic returns under uh, Bill George's tenure. High reinvestment rate, Stock outperformed the market five-fold <coughs> during that period of time. Bill George had the reputation for building a culture of highly, <coughs> pardon me, highly motivated employees. And once again, let me read what Bill George says about what he thinks is important. In my experience, motivating employees with a sense of purpose is the only way to deliver an in innovative product, superior service, and unsurpassed quality over the long haul. An organization of highly motivated people is hard to duplicate. The motivation will last if it is deeply rooted in employees' commitment to the intrinsic purpose of their work. 
Now this resonates with how we began this talk. About what's the purpose of the firm? And if you, you get that right and you motivate the employees, it's a win-win for everyone involved. Because customers, employees, and shareholders, over the long time, over the very long term, everyone's in the same boat. They share mutual interests. Now, uh, in contrast to Medtronics, <coughs> here's a steel company that actually eventually went bankrupt, Bethlehem Steel. And I've been analyzing this data for 50 years. And of a very large company that had managed to stay with a just dismal performance for a long period of time, this probably is a record. This is a steel company. Adversarial relationship with employees. Oh my goodness. Now look at the top panel. The red line is the average cost of capital. Never in those 50 years did they come close to being average. So all of this reinvestment is wasting resources which could have been recycled elsewhere. And so you, you can see <coughs> over this period, the stock underperformed you know, forever. Eventually, 100,000 employees lost their jobs. At one point, Bethlehem Steel had the highest paid unionized steel workers on, the, on planet Earth. Now, remember I said, that nothing works long term if, if a firm steadfastly fails to earn the cost of capital. You could be making the highest wage in the industry. <coughs> it's going away, which has happened here. Now, uh, earlier I briefly alluded to this notion of, of a career path for yourself, trying to plan out the kind of companies you want to work for and what you want to get out of your life. I was a mechanical engineering student on the far left-hand side in the early 60s. And Bethlehem Steel was coming on campus. Myself <coughs> and my fellow students, we were excited. Why? Because Bethlehem Steel was paying the highest starting salary for engineers, especially mechanical engineers. We were pumped up to go to work for Bethlehem Steel. Now, knowing what I know now, about how to look at a company and value creation, all the things we're talking about, this would be the worst place in the world you would want to would want to work for, right? Okay. Now, here's a different kind of a steel company, New <coughs> Corp, and for a long time, New Corp was run by Ken Iverson. I think one of the best CEOs of all time. And Ken Iverson had a scale insight. If you look back here into the early 60s, uh, U.S. Steel, <coughs> the big steel companies, had large integrated steel mills. Now Ken Iverson figured out that he could use scrap steel for a, what's called a mini mill, <coughs> and it would be much more efficient than these big integrated steel mills that were the industry standard. Now that, now that he could scale that up. So you see, in a really tough, tough industry, the steel industry, over a long period of time, it's cyclical, but their economic returns are by and large, large above the cost of capital. A very high reinvestment rate created a lot of wealth uh, for shareholders. <clears throat> so that's an example of a scale insight, and. Ken Iverson, in his, in his autobiography, uh, it's a wonderful book. Uh, it's called Plain Talk. And here's a quote. The great and terrible irony of modern business is that so many managers feel overburdened with responsibility, <clears throat> while so many employees feel unchallenged and unfulfilled in their jobs. Instead of telling people what to do and then hounding them to do it, our managers focus on shaping an environment that frees employees to determine what they can do and should do to the benefit of themselves and the business. You don't think of a steel company as being having a knowledge building culture, typically. This is. I'll give you an example. In, the, in his autobiography, uh, he was talking about a straightener machine saying that the rated capacity of this machine is 10 tons per hour. And 
new core employees have, have the freedom uh, and they're all, they're all, they all work on a team and they get paid on a bonus based on productivity. They're free to figure out how to increase capacity of, of machinery. So over a period of a year, they got a bigger motor. They, they did all these changes, uh, process insights, every day figuring out a smarter way to get this straightener to work. At the end of the year, Iverson reports, the rated capacity is 20 tons per hour not 10 tons. Mm. The manufacturer of the straightener doesn't believe it and comes out and says the machine can't do 20 tons per hour. So this is the kind of stuff that can happen with a knowledge building culture and a win-win partnership where employees are treated as important people and given freedom to work. That's the kind of culture when you're looking for a job, what you want to look for. Your number one objective is, a, is what kind of a culture Will, will I be on a fast learning track? Don't worry that much about the starting salary. That'll take care of itself. So, life cycle performance, we give a new core a big check mark. Win-win partnership. They pride themselves on, on how they treat employees and, and, and pay their employees. And actually, customers benefit from very high quality steel and shareholders have clearly benefited. Uh, here's my last chart, Amazon. Uh, what's remarkable that really catch, captures your eye, Amazon is a large company. So if you look at this, a few things. One is that middle panel, the reinvestment rate, you're looking at reinvestment rates 30 to 40 percent per year for a large company, it's, it's unbelievable. Now, it's getting very high reinvestment, uh, high economic returns. But note that the economic returns have peeled off, but the stock price keeps on heading to the moon. What's going on? What's going on is that, it, and I would encourage you to do this, in uh, the when Amazon first went public, uh, Jeff Bezos, his first shareholder's letter, he laid out the culture of Amazon and what's important. And it's so plain. One thing that is most important to the CEO, he says, whenever I have a choice between making a large investment that is likely to pay off over the longer term, but it'll hurt near-term accounting earnings, I'll always make the investment. So, when those economic returns are coming down, it's due to the mammoth large investments, and investors have learned to appreciate that Amazon has, a, has the track record of creating innovative, successful products. So when his accounting earnings may dip and his reinvestment is up, the stock is up, because the long-term net cash receipts are up. That's the key to understanding this incredible track record that Amazon has uh, delivered. Now, uh, here again, here's the last quote I'm going to read because I think it's very insightful to hear the CEO in his own words tell you about <coughs> how he manages the business. Company, companies get <coughs> skill focused instead of customer needs uh, focused. When companies think about ex extending their business into some new area, the first question is, why should we do that? We don't have any skills in that area. That approach puts a finite lifetime on a company because the world changes. And what used to be cutting edge skills have turned into something your customers may not need anymore. A much more <coughs> stable strategy is to start with, what do my customers need? Then do an inventory of the gaps in your skills. Kindle is a great example. If we set our strategy by what our skills happen to be, rather than by what our customers need, we never would have done it. We had to go out and hire people who know how to build hardware devices and create a whole new competency for the company. That, in a, in a nutshell, is what Amazon is all about. 
Now in the life cycle terms, earlier I made the comment that at that competitive phase <coughs> stage, the most important thing for management is to build or acquire capabilities that can provide sustainable competitive advantage. That's what Bezos did when he came out with a Kindle ebook reader. He didn't have the skills or capabilities to do that. Well, he acquired them and he made it happen. He continues to do this over and over and over, and over again. So, I can finish this up. Uh, I would encourage you to read chapter four of the Valuation Criti Creation Thinking Book dealing with the pivotal role of worldviews and building knowledge. It, it's a very useful chapter to, to the whole knowledge building area that I really haven't had the time to get into uh, this morning. And a very quick, efficient way, there's a YouTube video out there it's called Reconstructing Your Worldview in Five Minutes. Actually, it's a four and a half minute video. And finally, on a personal note, I would encourage you uh, to anything to do with lean thinking and systems thinking, which is so important for problem solving skills. Make that an intellectual hobby. Just read what you can read about that because it's, it, it'll apply to what er whatever area of employment you wind up in is this problem solving uh, skills <clears throat> and being able to identify you know, faulty assumptions. Okay, that's it. All right. We do have uh, looks like about six minutes left, according to my official clock here for questions, so have at it. <clears throat> yeah. Um, how come this, uh, is the long-term cost of capital is constant? Oh. It's, uh, it moves around. I drew it as a fat line, actually. <laughs> but over the historical period, I'm talking about 60, 70, 80 years in the US, the average company had an in inflation adjusted real, so called economy, so called real terms, been around 6%. Because there's a built in incentive. Companies get above that and they attract competition, and the competition forces it down. If you're below that, either you improve or your competitors put you out of business. So that tends to keep it at that centralized 6% rail. Yes. I have a question. Your, the two big failure cases you mentioned are Blockbuster and Kodak. It wasn't in the presentation and in the book. And in both cases, it seems like they should have been <coughs> At the forefront of seeing what the trends were. Sure. Right? And that's how do you have the guy with the thing walking around the halls at Kodak saying, here, uh, and they're just not interested. Yeah. So, what is going on? Is it, is it a cognitive block or is it a motivational block that makes the current leading firm not able to see what seems like it's right in front of their face? Right. It's, I think, the Intuit quote. Uh, where he talks about an experimentation culture, <clears throat> and he talks about everyone, including top management, <clears throat> should put their core beliefs open for criticism and feedback. Now, if you, if you don't do that, then you become insulated, and you look for confirming evidence. Mm. And the other thing is, top management at Eastman Kodak they were very successful, and they have a dominant position in the marketplace. So, it, they're inclined, their past experiences strongly suggest that what they've done produces success. Okay? And so, they're, they're, they have the blinders on, so to speak, uh, not to look for things happening in the outside world that can blow up all of their assumptions. <coughs> and they become late to the game. Now, Eastman Kodak had the resources to really dominate, you know, the, the new world of digital photography and, and not keep on making 35 millimeter film the way they were, were doing. But they were, and it, they had some smart CEOs that came in at <coughs> Eastman Kodak. They hired a guy who used to run Motorola. Uh, he knew what was wrong with the company. He couldn't change the culture. Mm. And he gave up and he just, walked away. 
And the other thing is, like on Blockbuster, <coughs> you, you want your firm to be adaptable. Now, if your business model is wired into physical assets, you spend an enormous amount of money for all these leases, all these physical stores across the country, you're kind of wired into that business model. And you don't want to think about all those decisions now are wrong. You just don't go there uh, if you don't have the right kind of a culture. So uh, that was the key to, <coughs> when Netflix walked in the door, they were trying to sell the company in the beginning. The blockbuster showed them the door. They said, this doesn't fit, doesn't fit. You see that over and over and over again, the, the notion of business as usual, complacency, the lack of a knowledge building culture. I have just a quick question also, because uh, I need to ask you about Bethlehem Steel. Mm -hmm. How much of that is, uh, you mentioned the distinction earlier between kind of free market capitalism and crony capitalism. Right. How much of it, given the nature of the steel industry, was Bethlehem being in bed with the government, so to speak, and getting all kinds of subsidies and protection, so that way they were insulated from market pressures for a long period of time? A little bit. And how much of it was what you've been talking about here, of just having blinders on? The thing with Bethlehem is uh, excessively highly paid, you know, managed, ridiculously overpaid. They built their corporate headquarters one time in the shape of a, a, a cross. It's an odd shape. They spent a fortune doing that. And then I read they did that because they wanted their vice presidents to get a view of the golf course. You, you can't make this stuff up, mm. okay? And their employees hated management, <coughs> had this adversarial relationship. And so if you go into a, a steel company at at Bethlehem Steel, it's not like Nucor, where everyone is treated, you know, as a valued employee, and everyone is motivated to increase productivity, and they get paid for their product. It was just the opposite at Bethlehem Steel. So, <coughs> Nucor is part of the reason for that company to go bankrupt. But it, it's, uh, it, it was remarkable that that sort of inefficiency could last that long. Today, it wouldn't. But in the 60s and 70s and 80s, it, it did right, We're officially out of time. So uh, thanks for being with us sure. today. It's just, it's <laughs>